Welcome back to the McMaster University course, Computer Science and Software Engineering 2FA3, Discrete Mathematics with Applications 2. My name is Bill Farmer, and today we're going to start the sixth topic of the course, the sixth and final topic, Turing Machines and Computability. This topic will have four parts. The first will be what is computability theory. That will be followed by the great limitation theorems, then Turing machines, and finally, undecidable decision problems. So the first question is, what is computability theory? Now, computability theory is an important component of computer science. Uh, we can define it quite simply. Computability theory is a study of computable functions. And another name for computability theory is recursion theory. So if we think about any function whatsoever that has, let's say, n inputs and it can be partial or total, we'll say that this function is computable if there's an effective method for finding the output that the function associates with an input or with a set of inputs. So that's what a computable function is. So there's some questions we, we would obviously like to answer. What is an effective method? And can every function be computed? We'll find out that every function cannot be computed. And this is why computability theory is interesting and very important. And the third question is, how do we show that a function is computable? And how do we show that a function is not computable? So let's start off with an important notion, an effective method. So an effective method, which we can also call a mechanical method, sometimes they're called effective procedures, it is a method for solving a family of problems in a mechanical way. So a mechanical way means we can solve it like a machine would solve the problem. An effective method satisfies the following requirements. The method consists of a series of steps in which each step results from e executing a precise instruction. So we have a set of instructions and we can execute these one at a time, step by step. And each instruction is expressed by a finite number of symbols. We don't have, in other words, ex instructions that can be infinitely long. The number of possible instructions is finite. The method finishes after a finite number of steps. And the method solves every problem in the family. And the method requires no ingenuity to succeed. Because it requires no ingenuity, it can be performed by a machine as well as a human. And you're familiar with the idea of an algorithm. An algorithm is just an effective method for computing the output of a function from a given input. Now, in computability theory, in general, we're considering which functions are computable, but often our interest is focused on two kinds of functions, two sets of functions. The first set is a function like this function, f, that takes a certain number of inputs that are natural numbers and gives back an f. So in other words, the first set are functions on the natural numbers. The second set is a, are functions that take some input and give back yes or no. These kind of functions represent decision problems. A decision problem is a problem where does something belong, does something belong to a subset of i in this case? If so, we get yes. If not, we get no. And often i is, is the set of strings over some alphabet. So let me remind you a bit about what is a decision problem. A decision problem is a problem to determine the answer to a yes or no question for a given input. So for instance, is a given natural number prime? This is a decision problem. For a given input for a particular natural number, we would like to decide whether that natural number is prime or not. 
Now, a decision problem can be identified with a function. It's a function that takes an in inputs and it returns either yes or no, or true or false, or one or zero, any kind of binary answer. And many, many problems can be formulated as decision problems. Now, a solution of a decision problem is simply a computable function that for each input returns an output yes or no that correctly answers the question. And this, a decision problem is decidable if there is a computable function that solves it. So let, let me go back up to here. So a model of computation is a scheme for expressing a set of functions in a form that enables computation. So it's a way of showing that our functions are computable because they're expressed in a way that we can compute with them. So DFAs is a model of computation for functions that represent membership in regular languages. So if we have a regular language R, we can come up with a DFA A, and we can take a string from R, and using that DFA A, we can compute whether that string belongs well, I, I should say we can take an arbitrary string. Maybe it'd be clear if I wrote this. We can take a string, which is in some set of strings, and we can give it to our DFA, we can compute with it, and we can determine whether that string is in R or not. So we can ask this question. And so DFAs are a model of computation for membership in regular languages. We can compute whether a string is in a particular regular language by representing that regular language using a DFA, which represents a, a function that makes the decision. OK, so that's a, one example of a model of computation. Now, the interesting notion is the notion of undecidability, of decision problems that are undecidable, for which there are no, there is no computable function that can solve these problems. It helps to go back and look a little bit about the history of computing. One of the most important people in the history of computing is this man, Gottfried Leibniz. Now you probably know about Leibniz because he's, along with Isaac Newton, he's one of the inventors of calculus. But Leibniz did much more than that. Leibniz is, is uh, one of the most amazing uh, polymaths that the world has ever seen. There's really no one to com compare to him that I can think of except maybe Leonardo da Vinci. He was interested in many things and knew, met, knew a great deal. Um, and he, he's probably most famous as a philosopher, but he was trained as a lawyer. Now, Leibniz was very interested in computing. He was interested in computation. He made a, or he designed a calculator, a mechanical calculator called the Stafelwalze. And this calculator was able to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and take square roots. This, no one had ever been able to create such a machine before. So this is something Leibniz designed and he had technicians built. So he was one of the great, first great computer engineers. Now, Leibniz was fascinated with computation and he really entered, entertained the idea that we can solve problems, many problems, with computation. We can compute answers to our problems. And so he entertained the idea of maybe we can compute answers to any, any question. So he developed a language which is called the Characteristica Universalis. Um, Leibniz did all his work, wrote all his papers in Latin. So this is a universal language that he was working on, he was thinking about, in which you could express any scientific statement. And 
in parallel of this, he was also thinking about a computer which he called the calculus ratiocinator. So this was a calculator that could take a statement expressed in the characteristica universalis and compute the truth or falsity of it. So this is what he's imagining. He's imagining a universal language and a computer that goes with it that can take any statement written in that language and determine whether it's true or false. So this is, this is like the ultimate application of computing, to be able to answer any question. And to, he's, he's imagining reducing philosophy to just writing things down the language and plugging them into the calculus ratio nader and getting out an answer. Now, the interesting thing is, was, was, is this all an impossibility? Was, was there any hope that this could actually happen? Well, no one really had an answer for Leibniz for about 200 years until two logicians, Alonzo Church and Alan Turing, both independently in 1936, they show that there are undecidable decision problems. They show that there are decision problems for which we cannot compute the answers. And this, this, they did this by construction, which means they actually produced, they described the actual decision problems that could not be decided. And so this shows that Leibniz's grand decision problem is a given scientific statement true. This is an undecidable problem. And as a result, it took 200 years to show that Leibniz's dream is not possible. Now, examples of undecidable decision problems are the, the, the two, probably two first examples are the Entscheidungsproblem. This is a problem of whether, of determining whether a statement you write in first or logic or some other logic is valid or not. And this is the problem that Church showed was undecidable. And another problem is a halting problem. If you have a programming language, you would like to know whether a given program halts or not on a given input. So Alan Turing showed that this was not, the halting problem was not decidable uh, for a particular model of computation. Okay, so there are many kinds of models of computation, but there's a special class of these models which we now call Turing complete models. So one of the models of computation is the model of using Turing machines, which we're going to look at in much more detail as we go through this topic. So a model is Turing complete if it's equivalent to the model of Turing machines. And in the 1930s, a, a bunch of, well, a group of these models were developed. So, so Church developed a model called the Lambda Calculus, in 1933, and people are still very much interested in lambda calculus. Turing in 1936 developed a model called based on Turing, what we now call Turing machines, which are abstract, um, idealized machines. And another model is general recursive functions, which people are very interested in today. This was developed by Kurt Gödel and Jacques Herbrand in 1934, but it was very much developed by S Stephen Claney uh, a few years later. Another model of computation is combinatory logic, which today is still a model people are very interested in. Um, combinatorial logic was developed by Moses Schoenfinkel, but it was really developed a great deal after that by Haskell Kurt. And the last model I'm going to mention in this group of models that come from the 1930s are post systems. This was developed by Emil Post. So these were early models of computation which happen to be all equivalent to Turing machines and so they're all equivalent to each other. Now since since the 30s, many other models have been developed, but I want to mention one model in particular. 
one Turing complete model in particular. This is the model of unlimited register machines developed by John Shepardson and Howard Sturgis. This model is interesting because it, the, mo the machines, these abstract machines, resemble how modern computers look. The machines are, are based on a bunch of registers, and you can move numbers, natural numbers, back and forth between these registers. And the machines are unlimited in two ways. You can have any number of registers you want, and each register can hold a natural number of any size. So all of these models, these Turing complete models, they are equivalent. And this is one of the most significant theorems in all of computing. It says there is this model of computation and we can get at it in a whole variety of ways. Because if you, if you examine these different models, they're very different. On the surface, there's no reason to believe that they're equivalent, but they are. They're equivalent because there's some basic idea about computing that all these models capture. So Church and Turing, they made a, they stated a thesis. And the thesis says that each Turing complete model of computation fully captures our intuition of what a computable function is. So what this means is, is anything that we can express with one of these models is computable, and anything we can't express is not computable. Now, there isn't a mathematical proof of this, but no one has ever come up with a function that we, that people would say is obviously computable, which is not representable in one of these Turing complete models of computation. Now, one way you can apply the Church Turing thesis is if you were working on something and you came up with a function that was computable and you asked the question, uh, well, this is this computable? According to the Church-Turing thesis, you would, if it's, if you think it's computable, if people agree it's computable, then it will be the case that you can express this function in any of the, any, cho any Turing complete model of computa computation that you choose. And so it, so it really seems, according to the Church Turing thesis, we know what computation is. We know what computable functions are. Computable functions are the functions that we can represent in a Turing, compute, Turing complete model of computation. So the, the really interesting thing is Church and Turing developed this thesis before there were modern computers. Okay, so we're going to stop here. This will, will continue. Uh, next time with the great limitation theorems. See you then.